Good evening and welcome. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit, amen. Come, Holy Spirit, fill the hearts of your faithful people, and kindle in them the fire of your divine love. Send forth your Spirit, and they shall be created, and thou shalt renew the face of the earth. Let us pray, O God, you've instructed the hearts of your faithful people. By the light and the fire of the Holy Spirit, grant that in this same Spirit we might be always more strong, loving, and wise. And may we always rejoice in the comfort and the courage which are the special gifts of the Spirit to us. And we ask all of this through Christ our Lord. It's a joy to welcome you. Thank you for coming out in such a fine number. I'm sure you will consider the evening very well spent because our speaker, Alejandro Bermudez, has a very rich experience from which he draws, and you will learn more about that as he is introduced. But I just want to say that I'm very proud and pleased that Alejandro has come to visit us this evening. I look very much forward to his talk to us, and uh, I look very much forward to some uh, interchange after the talk and there'll probably be time for that. So again, thank you for coming, and William, would you please introduce Alejandro? You know William Yalali, my executive assistant. Thank you, Bishop. And uh, I'm here introducing just because I am uh, also uh, very honored to call Alejandro Bermudez a friend uh, and one-time coworker as well. You probably read a good deal about him uh, here in his biography in the program, so I won't read that to you. Uh, you can see, though, that he is executive director of the Catholic News Agency and, and Asi Prensa in South America. And uh, it's hard to overemphasize the impact that that has. And when I was uh, going to work with Alejandro there, he was going to explain to me what that Catholic News Agency does. And I knew him as an esteemed journalist. I was expecting to get some imagery uh, from Chesterton or, or some great journalism scholar. And he said, he said, brother, did you see the movie Ghostbusters? <laughs> you know the scene in Ghostbusters where the big marshmallow, the Stay Puff marshmallow man's coming down the street and he steps on St. Patrick's Cathedral. And Bill Murray's character says, nobody steps on a church in my town. That's us, man. <laughs> nobody steps on the church in our town. His mission really is to present the teachings of the church to the world uh, in a way that is straightforward, in a way that is honest, in a way that's knowledgeable, so that the whole world can read them free online and see really what it is that the church is trying to speak to the world. Uh, and so it's a great honor to have Alejandro here. Uh, it's a great honor to hear him and his unique perspective uh, on our Holy Father, who he knows so well from South America and also his time now. So with that honor, uh, I'm very happy to introduce Mr. Alejandro Bermudez. Thank you, thank you, uh, Bishop, for the invitation. Uh, I'm honored to be uh, to be here, in uh, especially because I I always had a as a Latin American a great uh, imagination of how Madison would look like because during the 70s, um, many uh, Latin American economists were known in Latin America as the Wisconsin boys, just like that, Wisconsin boys. Uh, Los Wisconsin boys, <laughs> because they were, they were very influential in determining the, the kind of economics that were taught here in, in uh, Madison. So when I saw you know, the, the uh, Wisconsin School of Economics at uh, Wisconsin University in Madison, I said, it's like, huh? So this is where the Wisconsin boys came from. Oh, so it was, it's, it's, it's 
been good to be here in Madison and see some of the roots of, uh, of uh, what happened in Latin America during the 70s, including the kind of things that influenced in uh, Pope Francis. Uh, I just want to start with two, um, two uh, elements just to put a little bit of the context of why it is important to, to try to understand not only Pope Francis, but at the end of the day, every pontiff. Number one, because we Catholics of any stripe are basically papists. And even those who say that believe in a highly decentralized church and so forth are still fascinated about how the pontificate is going to work. I, I had a, a Catholic friend who said that for every Catholic, it doesn't matter how uh, they feel about the church or the kind of changes that should happen or not happen, every Catholic is always one pope away from a dream come true. <laughs> you know, so if the next pope would be like a continuation or a change or an enforcer or a dramatic difference from like, so if the next pope would be blank you feel the blank, you basically get what kind of Catholic you are. But that first part, if the Pope is inevitable in Catholics. So basically, we are all Papists. That's, that's, that's a Catholic thing. No. And number two, keep in mind that probably there wasn't a greatest favor done to the Catholic Church than the snatch by the uh, Italian Revolution, the unification of the Italian government of the, uh, the, of the uh, pontificate, uh, pontifical territories, you know, the, 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 temporal, the temporal power of, of the church. Why? Because it is hard to find in the past of the church such a streak of incredibly holy men that may differ in opinions here and there, but they all had in common the fact that since uh, Gregory the Sixteen, we have had impeccable moral examples of Christian life in all the popes. Doesn't matter where they stand in this issue or that other one, but we have a pope like St. Pius X and St. John the 23rd, a process of beatification for John Paul I, for Paul VI, and even popes who do not, who are not in a process of beatification, say like Benedict the 15, he was an incredible pope, in a, an outstanding holy man who just began his pontificate at the beginning of the First World War and ended, died out of sadness at the end of that war. So uh, Pope Francis is just another example of a man with an exemplary personal life that is keeping this long streak of, of incredibly virtuous human beings at the head of the Catholic Church. So though I, I just wanted to start with that as a context. So going into who is Pope Francis and what is in his mind, I am uh, convinced that there are three crucial factors that are very relevant to understand him. Number one, that he's Argentinian. Number one, that he's a Jesuit. And number three, who are his intellectual mentors? And so let's go to on being an Argentinian. As you know, from from Europe and from the United States, there is kind of a Mexican glass to see the rest of Latin America. You know, you probably, if you have seen the, uh, the movie A Day Without a Mexican, which, uh, which is a really funny movie that, you know, the plot is that all Mexicans suddenly disappear from California. So, so nobody knows what to do. <laughs> there is, there is this, this, this wife of, of a senator uh, who says, 
Honey, honey, I have found some Mexicans from El Salvador, you know. <laughs> and in, in the middle of the movie, there is that, this, this, this typing subtitle saying there are 23 other countries south of Mexico, you know. <laughs> so one of, one of those is Argentina. And it's very, very different than most of the other countries. Uh, they, uh, uh, the, the uh, um, Argentinians are, you, uh, as you know, have a reputation, maybe you don't know, they have a reputation of having an incredible self-esteem in, in, uh, compared to the rest of Latin Americans. So much so that there are tons of jokes around Argentinian self-esteem, you know, jokes that go like, you know what the ego is? Is the little Argentinians that we all have inside, you know? <laughs> or that probably the best deal is to buy an Argentinian for his true value and sell it for what he thinks he's worth, <laughs> you know? So, the, the, uh, that gives you an idea of how, how, how different they are in, in regarding the rest of, of, of Latin Americans. One of the, one of the uh, things that have, we have to signal is that Argentina, uh, Argentina unlike many, most of, of uh, uh, or all Latin American countries, has a major Catholic culture. It's unfortunate that, that major Catholic authors that are uh, as, as sophisticated and intellectually, intellectually uh, learned uh, like, like a Gilbert Keith Chesterton, for example, are only known in Argentina and few other Latin American countries. So they come to, come to my, uh, my mind in, in the, the uh, many, many priests and lay people who have been great theologians, novelists, Catholic uh, apologists, in, in, so in Argentina, you have an extremely lively Catholic culture. You have a tremendous number of publishing houses, many of them just uh, fi financed by, by, by uh, uh, benefactors because they don't, they don't make money. And you have a, a lively cultural Catholic debate inside. And it's not necessarily between say, the, the, um, the non-Orthodox or not official Catholicism against more official or quote-unquote conservative Catholicism, but about different lines or of totally acceptable Catholicism. For example, between the neo thomists and the more JP2 style personalists, very likely debates a lot of Catholic magazines a lot of conferences. It's just it's, it's just like a like a, a, a sophisticated European Catholic country in terms of the sophistication and liveliness of the Catholic culture there. As you know, most of the Argentinian population racially looks very different from the rest of Latin America because, as the, one of the many Argentinian jokes goes, is that you know to say the the uh, Mexicans descend from the Aztecs, uh, Guatemalans descend from the Mayans, Colombians from the Chipchans, Peruvians descend from the Incas, and uh, Argentinians descend from a European boat. You know, so <laughs> basically, there wasn't native population, and and 95% of the population is either from Spanish or Italian. Ascent, so it's very Eurocentric. The the uh, for many 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 uh, years and most of its republican life, Argentina has always had its back to the rest of Latin America, and look uh, uh, towards Europe. So that many European authors have been very European opera, European theater, European movies much less than American movies, which are extremely popular in the rest of Latin America. That's not the case with Argentina. 
The next characteristic is, is one of, uh, has one of the most highly formed episcopates in terms of, of doctorates. The, uh, during the, the um, uh, Latin American Bishop Conference in uh, Santo Domingo in 1992, which you know, I did one of my, my first stints as, as a Catholic journalist there covering the event, all the Latin American Episcopates will call the Argentinian delegation the Aplanadora Argentina, the Argentinian steamroll, because all of them would be two, one or two PhDs, experts in patristic theology, dogmatic theology, moral theology. And since Argentinians are very self-confident and very outspoken, in the middle of the discourse, when a Brazilian bishop would say, like, um, just as San Agustin said, so and so, and the Argentina would totally interrupt and say, sorry, bishop, that's not San Agustin, that's an Ambrose of Milan, you know? <laughs> so uh, so they, basically the rest of the Episcopates were kind of intimidated at the Argentinian Episcopate to the point that in some of the conference, the uh, the Every time a bishop would quote some, you know, major a father of a church or theologian would look at the Argentinian and say, "Like, am I right? You know, <laughs> is is the quote right?" So in in uh, that that is incredibly common. And the amazing thing is that out of Buenos Aires, Cordoba, eh, and Rosario, the rest of the Argentinian cities are pretty tiny, and they have a eh, they have but uh, very weird names, you know, like like New Mexico type of uh, type of names, like you know, truth or consequences. There are, there are dioceses that are called, you know, one eye deer, you know, venado tuerto. There is another one called Cafayate, which is a name of a pumpkin, you know. And you will have this: the Bishop of Cafayate, middle of nowhere, would be a you know double PhD in the Gregorian University. That's you know, it's one of those incredibly rare things. You know. And uh, we have already been in the high opinion of themselves, uh, and also very blunt with the examples that I, that I gave you. Things uh, uh, Argentinians are in general, in the rest of Latin America, considered very rude by the way they, they, they speak. They do not use euphemisms, which is a staple of the rest of Latin American countries. You know. Uh, is um, uh, uh, and in uh, another characteristic is that they are slightly uh, pessimistic. You know, uh, they they have this melancholic southern Italian personality. You know, things are not gonna come well. You know, yeah, the, you know this is this is a major screw up. Everything's gonna go wrong. Yeah, this is not the first time that Argentina goes into a crisis, and it's not gonna be the last one either, you know? <laughs> I mean, and I'm quoting the kind of, just, just FYI, my, 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 my dad is Argentina, my sisters too. I was born in Peru, but raised in Argentina, so it, this, I, I, I know what I'm talking about. I was raised in that environment, so when I went to Peru, I found like, man, these people is like super jolly, you know? No. <laughs> No, 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 they are just not Argentinians, you know. <laughs> so, it, the, uh, it, so that's, that's uh, those, those cultural factors, remember that we are, you know, as, as, or, as the great Spanish philosopher uh, would, would, would say, Ortega y Gasset would say, we are, we are us and our circumstances. You know, we're, so we are not defined only by who we are, but where we are, but what are we, what kind of culture we're surrounded by. So on being a Jesuit, obviously Jesuit has many meanings in, in the United States. It, no so much in, uh, it's, it's not exactly the same in, uh, in, in Argentina. In Argentina, there is a very, very strong Ignatian a, a Jesuit identity. So it's not like highly cultural, great colleges, very smart, uh, guys that would answer 
uh, you know, a question with another question, like, is it true that the Jesuits answer a question with another question? Who told you so? You know? <laughs> Instead, in, uh, in, 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 in Argentina especially, uh, the, uh, and especially the formation of, uh, of, of, uh, of uh, Pope Francis, is pretty much centered on the personal holiness at the center of his life. Remember that that was a very Ignatian concept. You, know, you have to be holy. That's the most important thing. And if you keep in mind that, that a young Bergoglio as a seminarian joined the seminary of the, of the uh, Archdiocese of Buenos Aires, he became totally mesmerized by one of the spiritual directors who happened to be a Jesuit at the seminary of Buenos Aires. And that's how, after nine months, he decided, I want to be like that priest. And that's how he switched from the archdiocese to the Jesuits, following the, 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 the holiness of this, of this uh, a incredibly holy Jesuit spiritual director. Of course, that was the last year that that Jesuit spiritual director was kept in the Archdiocesan Seminary. Since then, the Archbishop of Buenos Aires decided that it would be wiser to keep just diocesan priests in the staff of the Archdiocese. That has been the case ever since. And the other thing is the uh, the aggressive apostolate and uh, the aggressive apostolate and mission. Uh, remember that the, 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 the Jesuit motto at, at, uh, at Majorem Dei Gloriam, you know, to the greater, greater glory of God, is something that is related to a, a, a kind of a conquering spirit. You know, we go to the end of the world, we, we bring them to Christ, and that was something that that deeply motivated the Holy Father as well, this, this, this characteristic. If you see some of the examples that I, uh, that, 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 uh, of, the, of some of his disciples that, that, uh, that I, I uh, interview for, for my book, Pope Francis, our, uh, Francis, our, our brother, our friend, uh, something that is common among all his disciples is how aggressive uh, Father Bergoglio would be in sending them, as the master of novices, in sending them to do apostolic work in the least expecting times. Like when they were doing their spiritual exercises in the middle of a 30 day spiritual exercises, day, day nine, he will pull two of them and say, listen, this person is in need, go do whatever they need to help them, and then come back. So. He will, he will constantly push people to do this, this apostolic commitment in the most unexpected times. And obviously, there was also this, this, this uh, vision of being astute and strategic. Sometimes this is seen as something that will be worldly or not, not honestly Catholic. The, uh, the uh, uh, Argentinian Jesuits, Uruguayan Jesuits, the one from, from you know, most uh, hardcore Ignatian tradition, they were never embarrassed about that. They were never embarrassed about uh, uh, being uh, astute and strategic as long as it was moral. It was never, you know, the, the, the ends justified the means. But they took very seriously that we have to be shrewd as snakes, as serpents. It was for, 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 for them something very important. And many of the ways in which Father Bergoglio operated as a, as a, uh, as, as, as a provincial it was, was very much inspired by that, that knowledge, especially considering the incredibly hard political times in which he had to be a provincial considering that he was the youngest Jesuit provincial in the world at that time. So, uh, so he had to, to resort to, to being astute and strategic. 
And regarding being astute and strategic, I would like to, uh, to quote uh, this very close friend of, uh, of uh, uh, Cardinal Bergoglio, Jose Maria Poirier. He's a director of uh, Criterio, probably the most important Catholic cultural magazine in Argentina. Poirier said, uh, he, was, he, he was telling me the story, this is taken from my, from, from my book, and he said that right after Pope Benedict was elected, um, a British journalist approached him and said, listen, I've been hearing like this totally unknown Argentinian guy, Cardinal Bergoglio, was kind of a runner-up to the election of, of, uh, of uh, um, uh, uh, Pope uh, Benedict. Could you write a story about who this guy is, since you're you know, a good friend of him? And this is what he said. My headline of the article that he wrote was, what does Cardinal Bergoglio think? Nobody knows. So keep this in mind, okay? I believe that was always a key for him to have a great friendliness, to be very gracious, but always maintain a bit in secret the complexity of his thought, uh, of his thought above all with important subjects, okay? So keep this in mind when we're talking about, say, the upcoming sinner. By the way, Poirier completes this story and is in, 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 in the book. By the way, I mentioned in the book, not, not because I'm pitching the sale of the book, by the way, it's just how, how I, I, I interviewed all these, all these people. He said that uh, at, the, at, at a, um, at, at a, a reception six months later, uh, six months later after he published this in England, so it was supposed to be uh, not too uh, not too into the radar of the Archbishop of Buenos Aires. Cardinal Bergoglio approached him in the middle of the reception and say, "Jose Maria, so nobody knows what I think, huh?" And he laughed and turned around, and he was like, <laughs> "Whoa." This is scary. <laughs> in regarding his intellectual mentor, mentors, we, we 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 have to keep in mind that Archbishop, uh, that Cardinal Bergoglio, uh, as as a Catholic Argentinian and as a Jesuit, was a voracious reader, especially of many 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 Catholic authors. So they have had, uh, many of them have had great impact uh, in. Uh, on him, but when we talk about actual mentors, we should highlight two persons that are very little known, one of them totally unknown, and the other one very little known in the United States. One of them is Alberto Metol Ferre, a Uruguayan, probably the best Catholic intellectual, Latin American Catholic intellectual of the second 20th century, the second half of the 20th century. And the other one is a Russian that should be known in the United States, but is not. He is the one that was brought by, um, by Harvard to start in the United States the first school of sociology. So this Russian guy, Pitirim Alexandrovich Sorokin, is the father of American sociology. The reason why he is ignored is because he was profoundly Christian. And since he had an incredible encyclopedic mind and knowledge, he could not be debated. But he was still a Christian. So the history of academia in the United States doesn't have him as a favorite guy. Alberto Mertol Ferré died in 2009, so not too long ago, he was a, a, a very important intellectual with a great influence on Cardinal Bergoglio. How much, how much influence? Cardinal Bergoglio used to send a gift to his priests, something simple, emblematic, every Christmas to all his, his clergy in Buenos Aires. 
the only time he sent a book to all his priests was a book of Alberto Metol Ferre. In, so that gives you an idea how much he not only thought he was important for him, but he, he was relevant for all his clergy to get to know him. So Alberto Metol Ferre is better known for those who read um, Italian or Spanish. There is this Italian a journalist and author called Alver Metalli, who about five months, months ago published this book, Il Papa e il Filosofo, The Pope and the Philosopher. And it's the only guy that has actually made the connection and a very clear connection between Alberto Metol Ferre's ideas and Pope. Francis and his current pontificate. These were Metol's core ideas. I had the I had the, the honor of meeting Alberto Metol Ferre and actually share a podium with him. I mean he was the big, big guy. I was the young journalist in Mexico. And he was Uruguayan. Uruguayans are pretty much like Argentinians, so the way he would speak was very, very blunt, even for Mexican standards, vulgar. So I was standing in, you know, in the other corner of the same podium, and I could see Mexicans who are try to be, you know, very, very elliptic, uh, very elegant. You know, the way they talk, going all in shock between the incredibly smart comments he was doing and the extremely rude language he was using. You know? So, uh, Metol Corradias was, number one, that there is a manifested destiny for Latin America. And this is a very, very little known idea in the United States, but this was a really powerful idea for, for many, many uh, years. And the basis of that sense of manifested destiny was a profoundly Catholic manifested destiny because uh, Alberto Metol Ferre and other Catholics would say there is no way that such a large continent that shares for so many thousands of miles the same language and the same faith do not have a destiny in the future of the church in the third millennium. So there was this, this profound conviction that Latin America has somehow a crucial role in the future of the church and therefore of the world. It, for Metol Ferret, the end of the USSR, of the Soviet Union, was the end of, of, the, of militant atheism. The, the, the ideological proclamation that atheism was the alternative to build a just, successful, progressive, scientific society. But he said that militant atheism has been replaced by hedonistic atheism. So for him, hedonistic atheism was not so much about atheism, but much more about hedonism in which, according to St. Paul, their gut is their stomach, their lower bodies. And obviously, he saw the West, mostly the US, as the ultimate expression of that hedonistic atheism. And therefore, there was some kind of anti-US sense because it was seen as the natural obstacle to the manifested destiny of Latin America. Especially from a political perspective, you see the different invasions of the US Marines to Santo Domingo, Haiti, Nicaragua, and then the political interventions that were not necessarily military interventions, the Monroe Doctrine about how Latin America is basically America's backyard. So you know, it has to, 
It has to be a safe place for the United States, and that's it. So, uh, in this anti-American component of, of, of the uh, Latin American of Metol Ferre Manifesto's destiny, there was these two crucial things that were always mentioned in Metol Ferre and Metol Ferre's followers about America. The Monroe Doctrine as an anti-Latin American policy, you know, so basically Pan-Americanism led by the United States as a way to basically deny the unique identity of Latin America as a continent that is, is not equal to the United States. U.S. speaks English, we speak Spanish. U.S. is a Protestant nation, we're a Catholic continent. The, the, Latin America has its own identity. The Pan-Americanism is basically just geographic. We're all the same continent because we have a, a geographic continuity. So that th this was this tension between the Monroe Doctrine and the Latin American Doctrine of Manifested Destiny. And the other one is that you basically are aware of the fact that the, the, the Rockefeller report was basically a report that said that the problem with Latin America is the exploding population. So it was necessary major birth control. You probably are aware of the birth control experiments in Puerto Rico, especially with, with the sterilization. There was a massive US investment in sterilizing Puerto Rican women. And, and the other thing is that the Catholicism was basically a source of Latin Americans being a, a lazy, a being morally unaccountable, uh, disrespectful to the law, to the rule of law. Why? Basically because they believe in the sacraments. So, so that there is an outside power that basically cleans you up, especially confession. So in the Protestant view, according to, to the Rockefeller, you don't have confession. So you have to be at peace with your conscience. And therefore, that makes you incredibly law-abiding. So Latin Americans are not law-abiding, are corrupt, because they are Catholic. OK? So those, those were the components of why there was in this doctrine, but this manifesto doctrine, this kind of, of tension or opposition to, to uh, uh, what they saw it was the official politics of the United States. And just as much as, as, um, as Alberto, uh, uh, Alberto Metol Ferre basically turned this famous Nicaraguan poet, Rubén Darío, as kind of the emblem, the poetic emblem, uh, the, 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 the provider of the, of the Latin American manifested destiny's mystique in that will accompany the doctrine of manifested destiny. And just to give you an example, there is a very famous poem from Rubén Darío, famous among Latin Americans. This is the best translation that, about, that, I, that, that I found. And the poem is to Roosevelt. This, is, was, this was not to FDR, it was to Teddy Roosevelt. And it says, as you can see, it is with the voice of the Bible of the birth of Walt Whitman, Ruben Darío was aware of the uh, transcendentalist and Walt Whitman, that I should come to you, hunter. Remember, Teddy Roosevelt was a very avid bear hunter. You are the United States. You are the future invader. The United States is potent and great. You join the cult of Hercules to the cult of Mammon. Also, power and money. We are the America of the great Montezuma, of the Inca, of Christopher Columbus. Viva Spanish America, you know, hail Spanish America. There are a thousand cubs loose from the Spanish lion. And although, and although you count on everything, you lack one thing, God. So just this is to give you an idea of the vision against you know, secular secular United States and, and, the, and, the, and the Monroe Doctrine 
And this, this is one of the poems that was, that would be recited by, by Metol Ferre and, and, and his disciples by, by memory. As a matter of fact, I, I had to learn that when I was a kid, no? Mil cachorros sueltos andan del león español. That's the part of the, no, the, the, there are a thousand cubs loose from the Spanish uh, uh, lion. In, <clears throat> in the, 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 it, it also included a criticism to capitalism. And uh, in, in this criticism to capitalism is, is important to understand because uh, this is one of the things that have been uh, dramatically misunderstood in what the Pope teaches because the Pope is, is, op is, is, is ferociously opposed as, 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 a, as, a, as a disciple of, of Metol Ferre to what is called wild capitalism, which has a many overlappings with American capitalism, but it's not the same. And that's something that has not been, unfortunately, sufficiently perceived by the translators of the Pope, even the official translator. So, in, in, uh, in the the, uh, the 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 critic the criticism to capital, capitalism is that uh, he he doesn't believe that wealth he he sees this as one of the tenets of cap capitalism is that wealth is more effective than deliberate charity. You know, so he he doesn't believe that wealth will necessarily bring help to the poor. And the belief that the state has no role in helping the poor in a, in a deliberate manner is something that he doesn't believe. And the reason why is that in the Latin American context, that is true. Number one, there is not the tradition of giving generosity and volunteering that you can find in the United States. And only when the state has stepped in to create policies of support to the poor, those are the only circumstances in which there has been a consistent help to the poor. The system is, is more reliable than personal involvement. This is another thing that the, that the, uh, that the Pope opposes. And that, in general, uh, that you know, manifested destiny uh, uh, explains. The, the Holy Father doesn't believe in, in the fact that a system, say capitalism or the invisible hand of the market, will end up somehow helping the poor. Systems do not help the poor. Persons help the poor. And therefore, every Catholic has to be held accountable for the fact not only of poverty in general, but about the poor. Because the poor is my neighbor. So if a guy is hungry right next to me, I cannot say, well, I really have to fight for a system of wealth in which this guy won't die and have a greater opportunity to thrive. So I'm going to work really hard for you not to be hungry. But in the meantime, hold there, OK? <laughs> Try to stay strong. That's, that's totally unacceptable in, 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 in the thinking of the Holy, Holy Father. And that's why he is so Argentinianly rude in calling out Catholics to do things in terms of social justice to the neighbor. It's not socialism, it's not ideology, it's Catholic responsibility. Because in, in Latin as in Spanish, the word neighbor as in English is actually prójimo, which means, which comes from the, from the Latin proximus, which means the one next to me. You know, so the neighbor is not the guy that is circumstantially next to me because he happens to live in the house next door. And that's, in a way, um, 
uh, 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 poverty in the English language, but the prohimo, the, the, the proximus, is anybody who is next to me wherever I go. That guy becomes my responsibility immediately. So if I move there and I find someone who is in need, that guy is my responsibility. Not according to an ideology, according to the gospel. That's what is in the post line. And, and the idea that a, a successful system can accept human collateral damage is something absolutely unacceptable. Not for a Catholic. You can say, well, listen, they will always be poor. The God, I mean, Jesus himself said that, you know. The Pope said, yes, but it doesn't mean that there has to be poor because of our negligence. Oh, they will always be poor, therefore my neighbor can be poor. He's one of those guys, you know. <laughs> That's totally unacceptable. So as long as, as we can do something about it, it has to be something done on a regular basis. The next one, the one next to me, is my duty, is my concern. So if there are going to be poor in the world, it's not going to be because of me. It cannot be because of me if I am a serious Catholic. And the other criticism of uh, Pope Francis about but uh, uh, the, the capitalist system as understood in Latin America, what cap capitalism means in, in Latin America, is that overflow never works. There cannot be an assumption that overflow never works. The word, the word in Spanish is rebalse. Okay? What it means, what is, what is a rebalse? Rebalse means overflow of a cup. And that's why the Pope says, the overflow never works because greed makes the cup always great bigger, go, grow bigger. And we know that. We know how many young people said, like, once I make some money, I will be very generous with the poor. Once they get the money, they said, like, wait a minute. I need a beach house for my family, you know, for the summer. So uh, as soon as I got the beach house, I will start helping the poor. So by when you are really ready to help the poor, your obituary is in the newspaper. You know, because you always find a way to. Now, keep in mind, every time in, say, Evangelii Gaudium, the word trickle down appears, which is, as you know, is a concept that is related to, to um, um, supply-side economics, the kind of American-style capitalism, the Pope never wrote trickle-down. He, he, he wrote rebalse. The translation should be overflow. The translator, unfortunately, turned it into trickle-down, turning into a basically economic political debate and showing the Pope as trying to get into that economic detail-down debate. How is Pitirim Sorokin influential in, in, in the Pope? Pope Francis met Pitirim Sorokin through uh, Metol Ferré. Thank you. He met Pitirim Sorokin through Metol Ferré. Metol Ferré is, is, is the guy that basically introduced, discovered Pitirim Sorokin in the United States and was instrumental in making sure that some of his crucial words will be translated into Spanish. They are hard to find in English. So imagine how revolutionary it was to translate it into Spanish. Peter Sorokin is, this is, this is one, one, the first book ever published in, in Spanish of Peter Sorokin. This was, this was in the 50s. It's, La crisis de nuestra era, our, our age crisis. This book was crucial in influencing Pope, Pope Francis, future Pope Francis. Sorokin made an idea in this book where all cultures go through periods of crisis. 
Such crisis is mar marked by moral decay, the most important commonality of every cultural crisis, according to Pitirim Sorokin, is moral decay. And if you see one of the books available in, in, in Amazon of Pitirim Sorokin, he has this colossal book full of, of impenetrable graphics showing all these many cultures and how during the years the decay of these cultures were would coincide economic financial decay would would coincide with moral decay and those who completely failed basically failed with moral decay those who kind of rebounded rebounded because there was a rebound of moral values and that's why he his arguments were not were not a proposition they were they were seriously based on sociological and historical data that's why it was very hard to find anybody to debate Pitirin Soroki. Uh, the next concept, and this is something that you have to be to keep in mind, is that salvation of some cultures, so the way to 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 uh, to, to save them from, from total decay can only come from the peripheries. Are you familiar with this term? Can only come to the peripheries. And most importantly, Peripheries, periphery, the term periphery is a cultural concept. It's not a sociological concept. It's not an economic concept. For example, Metol Ferre and Pitirin Sorokin said the values of Christianity gave the Roman Empire a new revival and many, a couple of extra centuries of life because the cultural periphery, which was Palestine and Christianity, moved to the center. Because once the center is corrupt, it cannot renew itself. So in the concept of manifested destiny, it was the vision that the West is corrupting to the core. It is on its way to failure. And what is the periphery of the West, Latin America. But it's the closest thing to the West without being exactly the West is Latin America. So you see how that kind of matches with the concept of, of, a, a, of manifested destiny for Latin America. It's the periphery that will, will move to the core. Is, is interesting because in a couple of dialogues that the Holy Father has had, for example, with the priest of Rome or with the Franciscans, in both cases, he was asked about the people in the margins. And he, he did not take that, that word. He said, the peripheries, so he, he, he will not accept people in the margins as equal or a synonym of the peripheries. Because people in the margins is a sociological or economical term, whereas periphery is a cultural term. For him, the periphery is like Father Matteo Ricci going to China and evangelizing the Chinese at the same time that they would absorb the, some elements of the culture is Jesuit Father De Nobili in India becoming a Brahman Jesuit in order to reach the elite and transform it. That's what is in his mind when he talks about peripheries. It's the Pitirim Sorokin concept, not, not the sociological or, or exclusively sociological concept. Of course, there is a sociological component, but it's much more than that. Two things were crucial uh, in, in, the, uh, uh, in, in Pope Francis as a consequence of reading Sorokin. Sorokin was a great admirer of uh, Robert Hugh Benson. You remember Lord of the World, you know, or Master of the World, this, this novel about the end of the world and how the Antichrist, Antichrist will come. 
and how that Antichrist will basically look like Christ. And thanks to technology, he will develop capacities like flying up in the air and doing things that will look miraculous but would be able, but, but, but would be at the end only pro product of, of high end and known technology. And that is something that has tremendously impressed uh, Pope Francis. And he, so far in what it goes of his pontificate, he has quoted six times Lord of the World by Robert Hugh Benson by heart. We're not talking about, you know, documents and so forth. He has quoted him six times talking about the Antichrist, the power of the devil, the moment we're leaving, and how there are so many similarities and how, how Robert Hugh Benson was kind of a, of, of, of a prophet of our days. So there are a few, uh, a few things that for America has to be taken into account regarding Pope Francis. He has never been to the US and he speaks very little English. He understands English fairly well, but speaks very little English. It has, he has only analogies to imagine the church in the, in the United States. It, for him, the United States was for a long time until he started uh, being explained as a pontiff, not before, about the real nature of the Church of the United States, that it was sort of a German church. Very, very, very few remaining believers, but still a lot of money. Also, somehow there was a system in which, you know, Americans can still give a lot of money to the church, but basically the Catholic Church has been kind of decimated. The the, uh, the other thing is that now he's definitely intrigued with the U.S. Uh, why he has been receiving all these organizations, the PayPal Foundation, the Knights of Columbus, and I know for a fact that he has been asking, like, like who are these guys? I mean, like, they are, these are like, like real hardcore Catholics, incredibly generous. They are true believers. They don't come only for the meat and greed, you know. To, I mean, they, these guys are the real deal. What, 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 what's, what's up in the United States? So the other thing is that he's a very fast learner. The fact that he is, is, uh, is, is uh, his, his age doesn't mean that his intellectual curiosity is any l lesser. He is a tremendous fast learner. And I believe that most of his, of his learning of the United States will be by direct experience while he comes to the US for, for the world meeting of families. I think once he sees the multitude, there is, there is a potential, there is a possible meeting with the youth. That's something that he will try not to escape. There is a possible meeting with Hispanics. So uh, my fellow journalists don't say, you know, Catholic journalism reveals Pope's trip schedule for, I'm not. I'm just saying the things that are being discussed right now. And the things that I'm, I'm sure Pope, Pope uh, Francis would love to do. And I think that experience of the United States will finally put the US in the map uh, for the Pope. I'll, I'll be very happy to take any questions. I think you need this. OK. Um, after our short time of question and answer, um, we're going to invite you to come to the dining room for um, some cake and um, refreshments and also some time to meet our speaker. And um, some we do have some um, books available for purchase, and he's willing to sign them and greet you at that time personally. So. Thank you very much. You're eloquent and inspiring, and uh, thank you very much for uh, briefing us on uh, the Pavarello Papa. <laughs> Thanks for your time. 
Uh, what's his views on labor unions? There's pluses and minuses all over socialism, labor unions, lots and lots of issues. What's his experience or views specifically on labor, organized labor? Thank you. Um, he, he is, um, he is very, very favorable to it because of his background. He, he is a, a um, classic, uh, he, he's a classic, um, he's a son of a blue collar immigrant. He is a man from blue collar background and, um, and labor unions are very strong in, uh, in, uh, in Argentina. Uh, they have a long tradition, probably one of the largest traditions in, in, in Latin America. But at the same time, he has seen labor unions, especially the largest labor, la labor union, to depend too much on a political party. So sometimes uh, the labor union, when the, when, the, when the Peronista party was ruling, the labor union would favor politics rather than defending the workers. So they would you know, kind of follow the party line rather than protecting the workers as the nature of a labor union should be. So he is very much in favor of labor unions. He thinks that it's very hard uh, to protect the rights of, uh, of workers without labor unions. He believes that labor unions are a crucial part of the social doctrine of the church. And uh, he believes like many human organizations can go wrong. And uh, one of those ways to go wrong is when a labor union renounces to its core mission, which is defending and representing the workers to become involved in politics that puts that duty in the back seat. Thank you very much for being here, Alejandro. Uh, my question is, I know that you mentioned that um, Pope Francis is still learning about the US and he's very intrigued about what is happening here. Has he made any comments on the Latino community and what he envisions for the Latino community in the Catholic Church here in the United States? Yes, absolutely. As a matter of fact, one of his uh, closest friends, longtime friends in the Vatican, is the um, is the secretary of the Pontifical uh, Commission for Latin America, and the Pontifical uh, the Pontifical Commission of Latin America has been having more and more involvement in the United States. Although it is called, you know, for Latin America, it was created by Pope Paul uh, by Pope uh, Pius the Twelfth and is a rarity in the Vatican because it's the only geographic part of the world that has its own dicastery. There is no pontifical commission for North America or for Africa or for Europe or for Oceania. And this, this uh, pontifical commission has been having to do more and more with, um, with Hispanics in the United States upon the request of Pope Francis. So he, um, he, he doesn't understand all the details of a, how important, how big, how influential is the presence of Latinos in, uh, in the United States, but he's uh, absolutely convinced that they, they, they play a crucial role. And as I said, it is, it is very likely that when he comes here, he may hold one major event with Spanish-speaking Catholics in the United States. There's been uh, some, uh, a lot of articles in the Catholic press about this upcoming Synod on the family, and um, uh, Cardinal Kasberg uh, is being seen as uh, taking a position on one side 
And I, I read an article just today that um, Casper is claiming uh, the, the Pope's uh, friendliness to his position. And um, it seems that there's going to be, there is a division almost in the, in the uh, College of Cardinals. And I'm wondering, is, is this one of his in secret things or <laughs> uh, what, what do we know of his position on divorced Catholics? Uh, I mean, well, not uh, divorced and remarried Catholics. Um, so. it, well, first of all, <clears throat> I, was in, I was in Rome when it was, uh, when, when an, a US site translated an article from a French new, uh, daily Catholic newspaper about the Pope being angry, quote unquote, as an upcoming book of five cardinals defending the traditional Catholic position on communion for a, a divorce in a new a relationship. I can tell you that's absolutely not true. As a matter of fact, I wish the case would, different, uh, would be different, but the Pope was not even aware about the book. That's the truth. Among other things, because he doesn't read, read English, and the book will be published in English. And, uh, and it hasn't even been sold yet, so I'm, 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 there is no way he got a kind of, you know, sneaked out copy or anything like that. Especially when, again, he doesn't read uh, English. I can tell you he was very interested in the past in an American author, and someone has the charity to translate that American author into Spanish so the Pope could read that American author. That's how much he doesn't read English, okay? Now, <clears throat> I don't pretend to, uh, to interpret what is in the Pope's mind, but I can tell you this. He is not afraid about um, um, opening a discussion about what to do with uh, divorced and, uh, Catholics in a un new, new union. Uh, when he was in Buenos Aires, he uh, supported and actually helped create a, a, a ministry a, addressed to deal with couples in these circumstances. And it was all based on what Pope John Paul's Familiaris Consortio would, would explain about that, which is basically the, 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 uh, the doctrine of the church and a, and, and a little plus in terms of pastoral approach. Basically, if you have a new union and you live in chastity, you can receive communion. And if you cannot live in chastity, since you are not being kicked out of the church, is basically you cannot receive communion, but you're, you have not kicked out of the church, Prayer and the practice of charity should be the way to take you to the point in which you can live up to the demands of being capable of receiving communion. So basically, this ministry in Argentina, yeah, I'm trying to remember the name, but something related to uh, uh, the boat or the sea, you know, it was like, uh, uh, I, I can't remember the name, I hope it comes back to my mind. Uh, so the Argentinian bishops being, being what normally people would identify as fairly conservative, uh, they, they were you know, looking really with a, with a magnifying glass how this experiment was going. And, and I can tell you, this, these people were abiding by the rules of the church. The only ones receiving communion were the ones that were living like brothers and sisters, and the ones that were not able to do that were extremely, I mean, very heavily involved in, in charitable activities. Many of the major charity activities will have these couples involved in the archdiocese in Argentina, in Buenos Aires. In, uh, at the very end of Pope John Paul's pontificate, this ministry sent a letter to the Holy Father through the nunciature requesting consideration 
for the Holy Father to reconsider the possibility of creating circumstances in which those living in that kind of a relationship would have access to Holy Communion. Okay? That was a request. When Pope Benedict was elected, they sent again this request to the Holy See. Cardinal Bergoglio never allowed this ministry to stray away from the pra practice of the existing doctrine. But on the other hand, he did not oppose this ministry to send those letters to the Vatican. Okay, so I think this specific anecdote kinds of give us an insight of where the Pope stands. I can't imagine the Pope being mad at the fact that five cardinals are coming, uh, are pushing back to Cardinal Casper. That's exactly what he wanted. He said in a couple of interviews, I don't want to change the doctrine. I want an open discussion. And an open discussion means I say yes, you say no, let's, let's discuss, let's debate. And this goes to a a, a principle that he would always repeat and he would he, he, he's still repeating unfortunately it doesn't translate into English very well in Spanish he said I prefer una iglesia accidentada en vez de una iglesia enferma which means I would rather have an, a, a church that has been hurt that has suffered an accident, like bro breaking an arm or a leg, rather than a sick church. And what does it mean for that? Is when you're sick, you stay, you stay at home. So basically, you avoid any kind of risk. If you stay at home, it's basically because you are sick. You have asthma. You have you have you know the cold or cancer or whatever you that's why you stay at home but the church is not be it's not meant to do that it's go to go out but you know what will happen when you go out you and I know that one day we will crash our car you know we will we will you know rear end somewhat a rain will catch us without an umbrella hail with you know, destroy our car. But that's part of life. Because there is a chance of that happening, that doesn't keep us inside the house. So we take risks. And the consequence of risks is that you break a leg, break an arm, get a cold, get into an accident, bad things happen, but you get a life. You leave, you go out. You do good things. You accomplish something. So that's a mantra that he has always have repeated. Prefiero una iglesia accidentada que una iglesia enferma. So this combines very well to his idea of let's have a discussion. We're not going to change the doctrine. I'm a son of a church. But what happens is something come out out of the discussion under the inspiration of the Holy Spirit. That's that I, I I I don't pretend to to know what is in the Pope's mind, but I think these two pieces of 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 his personal history kinds of gives us an idea of where the Pope stands in this. But I, I hope it helped. Alejandro, can you? Um Do you know uh, if Pope Francis has talked about his ideas about overpopulation and its relationship to uh, unending poverty, this poverty that he wants to eradicate? Does he talk about that at all? Oh, yes, yes. He, he used the word, um, he, he, he used the word Malthusianism or neo-Malthusianism as a really bad word, as an insult. Um, it, 
that has been that, that has been a very common issue when he um, fought a potential legislation in Argentina about a, about easing the distribution of birth control, especially in uh, in poor areas, um, as a way to deal with poverty. And um, he um, he will ridicule that as saying, uh, basically, this is like killing your guests in the table instead of bringing more food because there is not sufficient food in the table you know so it's, it doesn't make any sense and there is written testimony of that in his um, in his in the book that he co-wrote with Rabbi Abraham Skorka uh, which I translated into English um, is is a, a book from from uh, image books called uh, on heaven and earth there is there is a part in which he speaks about neo malthusianism in those in those very very uh, critical terms we'll take one more question oh i'm sorry With a refreshment, Father. <laughs> With a refreshment, no problem. <laughs> so this is a slightly more cultural question. So I don't know if this is if yours is more theological. Maybe we should go with yours. <laughs> um, all right. Um, so I just you know I've been hearing about the, the sovereign debt crisis in Argentina in the news, and I was just wondering if you could comment on that and what you know how it would affect him or his thinking or something like that. Um, there is a, there, there, there is this um, a, um, tremendous um, sadness and kind of um, resignation in general of, uh, in, in the Argentinian Episcopate to how incredibly corrupt the political system is in Argentina. Argentina is an extremely wealthy country. Remember, it was the second richest country after the United States, right after the end of World War II, because it was basically feeding the rest of the world. So how come a country with that kind of wealth can be falling into constant crisis? Those who are less young here probably remember, probably has lost count of which number of crises, of financial crisis this is in Argentina. So. Yeah. The the uh, the Pope is like most uh, Argentinian bishops convinced that only a total overhaul of the political system in Argentina will 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 make a a difference. Any kind of cosmetic change that uh, keeps Argentina being sort of a of a southern Italy, you know, in which like sixty percent of the people lives out of government, some kind of government hound out, be it a overgrown bureaucracy or, a, or, or money, money being given away, the system is, 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 is not going to change. So, and this doesn't change the fact of the courtesy of sitting tomorrow for lunch with the president of, of Argentina, but definitely he he does not believe the rhetoric right now in Argentina going out that uh, the vultures are taking advantage of of uh, the, uh, the, uh, the the debts in which they incur and didn't pay. So, hope that helps. Thank you, Alejandro, and um, we just want to thank him for being here. Thank you so much. Again, we do have cake and refreshments in the dining room, and Alejandro will be down there to greet people individually and to chat with you there.